thank you very much for um, joining us today. My name is Melissa Lee. I'm the Directing Attorney for the Institutions Project here at Columbia Legal Services. Um, and I'll be presenting today on CROP with Alice Bergstrom, who is our Legal Assistant and Reentry Clinic Coordinator. Um, so thank you very much for coming um, to this training. We are so excited that CROP is finally here and hope that lots of people will um, benefit from it and use this process. Um, we have some people in the room with us today. We also have several people joining us via web. Um, for those of you in the room, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and those of you who are attending online, um, if you could use the chat box for a question, we do we do have someone monitoring um, for questions, so she will let us know if, um, if it comes up. Um, so there, today the plan is to walk through um, who qualifies for crop, um, what a crop is, where to get one, how to get one, what it does, and then um, walking through an example so people can see kind of what it might look like in practice. So we will start. Um, one other thing before I get started that I want to mention is that we are recording today's presentation. So um, if you know anyone who you think would benefit from um, this training, they can access it sometime next week on our website. Um, and maybe Alex could send out an email with that information for others to pass along. So, um, CROP was passed this session um, in 2016 by the Washington State Legislature. It was House Bill 1553. Um, a copy of the bill is available on the legislature website. It was became effective yesterday, so today is day two of, of um, people's ability to get a CROP. It stands for Certificate of Restoration of Opportunity. Um, so a CROP is a court-issued certificate. It's intended to reduce barriers to employment for people who have criminal records um, and who meet certain qualifications by restoring their eligibility to get certain occupational licenses. We also hope it will help um, reduce barriers to um, employment and housing in other ways as well. So let's talk about who can get a crop. Um, first, it, it's important to know that it applies to both juveniles and adults. It also applies to um, juvenile offender matters and adult convictions. So if you are working or know an adult who has both types of convictions, they can get a crop that applies to um, their entire criminal history. Um, and then people have to meet certain criteria in order to qualify for a crop. The first criteria relates to um, the conviction history of a person. So an applicant may not have any Class A felonies. These typically tend to be um, higher level violent offenses. They may not have um, any sex offenses. Um, this includes crimes with sexual motivation, enhancement, um, luring, <laughs> as well as any um, crime with a sexual motivation, or sorry, any crime that requires sex offender registration. Um, there are also a list of a, of a handful of other crimes that are um, included in the statute, which include extortion one, drive-by shooting, vehicular assault, um, and a couple of others. But anybody else who does not have these would, would uh, um, be eligible for a crop, and that's going to be most people. Most people don't have um, class A's or um, sex offenses, so we think a lot of people will be eligible for this. Yes? Annie? Okay. Uh, questions? Okay. Sure, go ahead. Quick question, if you could clarify. Did you say people who have sexual motivation enhancements on their crimes are also out? That's right, yes. Yeah. So the question was um, if a sexual motivation enhancement on a crime makes someone ineligible, and it does make them ineligible. Or even just the designation that there was done with sexual motivation. Yes, okay. yeah. yes. So the second um, criteria in determining um, eligibility for a crop is the waiting period. So there is a, ra a range of waiting periods um, in the statute, anywhere from one year to five years. This depends on the um, class of the crime, um, as well as whether the person served any time in incarceration. 
So um, kind of at one end of the spectrum is someone who has a conviction for a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor and did not serve any time in incarceration, then the waiting period would be one year. If they did serve jail time for misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor, the waiting period goes up to 18 months. Um, for class B and C felonies, it goes to two years, regardless of whether they serve time or not. Um, and if there is, if someone has a violent offense that was a B or C felony um, and isn't excluded for any of the other reasons, then they would have to wait five years before they would be eligible. Okay, so if we know that someone has a conviction history that makes them eligible and they've waited the sufficient amount of time, then you have to look at whether they are in compliance with their sentencing requirements. So um, the statute requires that people are in compliance with all sentencing requirements. Um, this would To find out what, what the um, terms of the sentence are, you'd have to look at the judgment and sentence. But one of the most common um, terms of a sentence are um, payment of legal financial obligations. So someone may qualify for a crop without having paid off their LFOs, but they do have to be um, current in their payments or they can show good cause. And so, you know, if someone is not current in their payments but they have good cause, let's say they're unemployed and their monthly payment is set at $250 a month, they might be able to um, argue for a good cause exception from the court for why they're not in compliance with um, making their LFO payments. Um, but then, you know, of course, you have to look at the judgment and sentence to make sure that all the other requirements are being met. Um, and finally, um, the last requirement for eligibility for who can get a crop relates to um, additional criminal history. So there can't be any new um, criminal justice involvement, including arrests, convictions, or pending charges um, since the date of the last conviction for which you're applying for a crop. one-time or you read that I'm just like, oh, so what about people that have done multiple? No, you, you know, sure. So the question is um, whether someone who has more than one conviction is eligible to apply for a crop. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So yes, as long as the person has met all of these requirements since their last conviction, then they can, they are eligible. So someone can have multiple crimes and still qualify to apply. Um, okay, any other questions about eligibility? Great, so now we'll move on to talk about where to go to get a crop. So the statute um, defines a qualified court. So to get a crop, you can go either to the superior court in the county where, the, where you reside, or to a, um, a superior court in a county where the person has been convicted or adjudicated. One important thing is, you know, the, the um, statute requires that the applicant go to a superior court. So if the court of, con of conviction is a court of limited jurisdiction, like a municipal court or a district court, then you would go to the superior court in the county where the district or municipal court is. So as an example, if the person has a misdemeanor conviction from Seattle Municipal Court, they would need to file for a crop, and they, let's say they also lived in Seattle, they would need to file for a crop in King County Superior Court. Um, one other important thing to note is that um, if a person is applying for a crop in the county where they reside but they don't have any convictions there, that county can decide not to consider the crop application. If that, if that happens, the court um, is required to dismiss the, the crop tree. Yes. The court is required to dismiss the application um, without prejudice, and then the person can go to the county of conviction um, to apply for a crop there. We don't know how often courts will do this. Um, we'll just have to see as it, play, it plays out, but it is an option that um, the courts have. Um, has there been uh, judicial training, or is there envisioned to be judicial training to train the courts about Yes, so the question is whether there already has been or whether there are plans to train judges about crops. Um, I don't know if the judges themselves have um, conducted any training yet. I know that we have been in communication with um, some of the judges' associations about planning that and 
would hope to um, assist with training them. So I don't know the exact answer, but I know it's been talked about. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, we've talked about who qualifies for a crop, where to get a crop, now we're going to talk about how to get a crop. So because a crop can apply to multiple convictions in multiple jurisdictions, um, before I go on, I'll, we have a question on the chat. I'm sorry, we've got okay. a question from Gianna. Okay. If someone were approved for a crop and committed a new crime, would they be eligible in the future? Okay, so the question is, um, if someone uh, obtained a crop and then had new criminal history, would they be eligible in the future to get another crop? The answer to that is yes, but they would have to requalify. So they would have to, um, you know, make the crime couldn't be on the list of disqualifying crimes. They would have to wait um, the the you know meet the waiting periods that we just talked about. They would kind of have to go through all of the new or all of the um, eligibility criteria again. Another important thing that I'll get to in a bit, but I'll just mention now, is that um, the crop applies to everything that has happened in the past. It does not apply to any future criminal activity. And so in that situation, the you know, if the person, um, you know, had a crop and then committed a new crime, the crop that they had from the past would not apply to the new crime. They would have to get a new one, just as was suggested by the question. Okay, so back to talking about how to get a crop. A petition for a crop has to be filed as a new civil action um, because it will apply to multiple offenses, potentially, in multiple jurisdictions. Um, this was the mechanism that, that was decided on for um, ap applications for a crop. So as many of you may know, um, there's typically a filing fee associated with um, filing a new case in court for civil action. Um, however, it's, it's important to know that there is a court rule, General GR 34, that allows for a waiver of the filing fee if the person can show that they are indigent or cannot pay it. Um, some of the ways that a person can show that are that they receive public benefits. Public benefits. Um, if they receive assistance, and it's here on the PowerPoint um, under any of these programs, it's assumed that they um, are indigent for the purposes of GR 34. If their household income is at or below 125% of the federal poverty limit. Um, so for example, for a family of four, that would be just over $30,000 a year. Um, if they do make more than 125% of federal poverty level, but they have expenses that make them unable to pay, then they can um, qualify for waiver of the filing fee. If they're working with a qualified legal services provider um, and there's a declaration is filed by the attorney or advocate who's helping them, um, they can get it waived. And so qualified legal services provider might be any of the legal aid providers or community legal clinics, um, for instance, Northwest Justice Project, Columbia Legal Services, um, many other volunteer lawyer um, programs and legal services providers. Um, and finally, there's an exception for other compelling circumstances. So obviously this is leaves room for someone to argue um, that they are unable to pay the filing fee um, in these circumstances. For instance, if someone has a really high LFO payment, um, that impacts their ability to have extra money at the end of the day, even if their income is higher than what is allowed under the GR 34, they might be able to make an argument. So luckily, part of the um, statute required that the Administrative Office of the Courts develop forms that make this process accessible to people. So those forms have been posted this week. They're complete and ready to use. Um, they're on the court's website. There's a link um, in the PowerPoint that we'll post, and it's um, written out here on the, on the um, slide as well. Um, but there are three forms that are, are important to pay attention to for someone who's applying for a crop. The first is the petition for certificate of restoration opportunity. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll show you examples of these later, but just an overview for now. Um, the petition is what uh, includes all of the criteria that we've just gone through that ensures that someone has um, met the, the criteria and is filing in the correct place um, to get the crop. The second is a notice. 
Um, so when you, when someone is applying for a crop, they are required to give notice to the prosecuting attorney in the county where they are applying, as well as the prosecuting as well as the prosecuting attorney for the juris for any jurisdiction in which they have a conviction in the last five years. So if the person has been convicted, let's say they're applying in King County, and two years ago they were convicted of a misdemeanor mm -hmm. in Yakima County, they would be required to provide notice both to the King County prosecutor as well as the Yakima County prosecutor. The third form that's um, on this website that they would need to file would is the proof of service of notice. So this gives the court knowledge that you know it's proof that they have served the prosecutor's office with um, notice of their petition. All of these forms are available online. We'll post links to them on our website as well. So in order to complete these forms, um, especially the petition, um, the applicant is going to have to gather certain information about their, um, their history to um, be able to provide the court with the information they need. So some of the basic information they'll need to know is their criminal history. Um, Alex will walk through in a moment um, a couple of places where you might be able to find that information. Um, they'll need to know if they, if they served any time um, in jail or prison. They'll need to know their date of release from confinement. Um, they might be able to get this information from if they're still in contact with a community corrections officer or a um, probation officer, they could get it from that person or they may need to contact the, um, the county jail or Department of Corrections to get proof of that. Um, They'll also have to submit a copy of the judgment and sentence for each conviction for which they're applying for a crop. Um, and again, Alex will talk about that now. All right, thank you. So uh, I'm just gonna talk really briefly about um, access to criminal histories and the docu some of the documents that um, you need in order to apply for a crop. There are a couple different tools for um, looking at one's criminal or just legal history. Um, some of you will have a lot of experience with these tools already, but uh, some may not, so hopefully this is helpful. Um, it's also good, I think, to have some familiarity with the ways in which employers and potentially landlords uh, can see people's criminal records. This is all public information, um, and so it's good to have an idea of what other people are looking at. Um, the first tool is the Washington Courts database. Uh, it's dw.courts.wa.gov. This uh, is all public information and shows, um, you can look up a person by name, you can look up specific cases if you have case numbers uh, and know which court they're from. Um, but it's pretty straightforward, search for person, search for case. And a docket like this um, will come up for a person um, assuming that their name is spelled the same in all of their different court proceedings. Um, these are not necessarily all convictions, but somebody who doesn't uh, really know um, the details of this system might not know that, so an employer could see something like this and assume that it's 13 different criminal convictions. It very well may not be, and it's probably not. Um, an important thing to know about this uh, is the numbering system, especially for the superior courts. So you can see numbers 3, 6, uh, and 12 are all in um, superior courts, one or, one or multiple um, superior courts. Then the numbering system is the same. It has two digits, which represent the year um, of the charge, I believe. And that third digit is... Um, a signifier for the type of court proceeding. A one is a criminal matter. It can be a misdemeanor uh, occasionally or a felony. Um, and then there's two, three, and eight, which are um, civil, domestic, and juvenile, not necessarily in that order. But um, the criminal matters are often the most significant. Um, other smaller courts, district and municipal courts have their own numbering systems so looking at this is impossible to say outside of superior courts what is criminal and what is not um, to find out that information you can just search for that court on the internet and see if they have that information 
Otherwise, you may need to call them and ask about information for a specific client or on a specific case. Um, once you know um, which cases are criminal, which cases are relevant to the crop application, you will need to get some documents. The judgment and sentence is helpful, uh, which is something that looks like this. This is a pretty standard superior court judgment and sentence. Uh, the district court ones can look different, but they're they're generally um, pretty recognizable. This is just the first page to give you an idea of what you'll be looking for. It has the um, the charges that were of conviction there um, on the front page. In the following pages, they will have information on legal financial obligations, which, which are also important to a crop um, application. So the watch report from the Washington State Patrol is also something to be familiar with. Um, this, as I understand, is one of the more common sources for a background check that employers will use. I think there are other, some other services. I've seen background checks uh, provided by clients at our clinic that clearly did not come from watch. I'm not exactly sure who the vendor or ser server was on those, um, but they have uh, similar yet different information, but watch is one to be really familiar with. Anyone can sign up for an account with this um, service. You do not have to be a legal service provider. You don't have to be an employer. So theoretically, anybody can access this. It does cost money to request these criminal records, um, but this is something that uh, may help you gather appropriate records for a client. Sometimes we often have clients who use different names throughout their lives and or um, you know might the court could simply spell their name differently and it they may have a criminal history that does not come up when you search for them on the Washington courts database. This often will have a more complete picture of a person's criminal history. Um, there are issues in both systems with duplication of information, inaccurate information, um, you really have to look carefully at the language on some of these entries to even know if, if there was a conviction. Um, you could be looking at, a, at an arrest record or something else. Um, and often job, job providers do not see or know the difference. This is generally what a watch report um, looks like. It's not the easiest thing to look at, um, but there's a summary typically at the top. This person had zero felonies, a couple gross misdemeanors, um, and then it looks like they had a domestic violence issue. And the following pages would lay out which courts those were in, whether there was a guilty plea or guilty conviction, uh, and they'll have the case number, which is really helpful. There is occasionally some information on legal financial obligations. Um, but I wouldn't consider that reliable. The best way to get accurate information is contacting a, the clerk of the appropriate court directly to get that information. You can often get it over the phone, but if you want a written record, there's a more formal process. Sorry, question, yeah. Um, Alex, I'm just wondering if about, uh, <coughs> pardon me, if you've had like with any of the folks, obviously you're just starting this, but the idea that people can actually contact their public defenders um, and you're know, calling their public defender office because they're entitled to their files and to get a copy of the judgment and sentence, and that may be a way to think that could be much easier than having to actually go through these labyrinthine databases and dealing with the clerk. Obviously, it's not going to give information about whether somebody's current with LFOs, but it seems. Um, I don't want to say that anything about this or contacting public defender offices is easy, but um, the idea that people could actually call up their public defender and get a copy of their file and certainly their JMS. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So the, I'll just repeat. The comment was um, that the public defense office should be a resource to anyone applying for a crop. They can access their judgment and sentences and other records that way. Um, I know from our experience, we tell people that and they don't know it on their own. Um, Sometimes people have convictions that are so old that they assume or know that their public defender is gone, and they figure that that's you know that's it as far as their connection to the system. But yes, that's really important. I should also mention um, 
I almost forgot that the state is moving toward a new system called the Odyssey Portal, which I, my understanding is that it's going to replace the JIS system. It's only um, active in several counties, I think four or five counties at the moment. Uh, I don't have a ton of experience with it myself. You can access it, I know, as as a public user and request this, the same documents that you can through the court, the Washington Court database. Uh, but there's also a way for legal providers to sign up for an account uh, and I think have some additional um, clearances the way that you would through the JIS system. Um, and that's about it for all histories. All right. Um, so that is great information about how to um, gather information about criminal history and some of the resources people can go to. Um, so the fourth step in um, how to get a crop is, as I mentioned earlier, providing notice to the prosecutor. So again, this needs to be provided to the prosecutor in the county where the person is filing, as well as in any jurisdictions where the person has a conviction from the, during the last five years. Um, and one thing, another thing that's important to know is the, the applicant does have to um, list their criminal history on the crop petition, but the prosecutor's office um, is required to provide a criminal history to the court. Um, so the court will also be getting the criminal history from another source. So assuming all of the requirements have been met, the paperwork has been submitted, um, then the court will consider the application and decide whether to issue a crop. The law is written in a way that, will, that assumes that the court will not hold an in-person hearing on the crop application. However, the court has the discretion to do so if, if the judge has questions about the application. Um, we think and hope that most people will not have to appear in person, but it is a possibility. Can I add one piece just from the prosecutor sure. side? Yeah. So you say provide notice, and I know that the forms talk about attaching your supporting documentation, but just so that's not missed, I know like if they want it without a hearing in for us to just agree or sign up, not just the notice, but making sure that documentation, whatever they give to the court is also there. I, I know it's obvious because it's mentioned in the form, right. but it will speed things along. Because sometimes we have defendants who are doing stuff like that and they think the notice alone is enough. And, right. So that's just another piece. Sure, yeah. So um, Laura Petrigal, who's here from the King County Prosecutor's Office, had a good comment that um, just some advice that when people are providing notice to the prosecuting attorney's offices that it's good practice to attach a copy of their petition so um, the prosecutors can see whether they're requesting a hearing um, and also what they've already provided to the court. Um, so, and again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but just to review that the court can decide whether to, um, if, they, if they decide to grant a crop, they can decide whether the crop applies to everything on the person's criminal history or only the convictions from the jurisdiction where the crop is being heard. Um, so let's say someone um, has convictions in both King County and Yakima County. They've applied for a crop in King County that judge might decide, I'm going to give you a crop, but it only applies to the convictions from King County. If you want one for Yakima County, you need to go file again in that. Um, and this is just because some judges may feel uncomfortable um, issuing something that applies to uh, um, decisions that were made out of their own jurisdiction. That's all. Do you know if there's a difference between uh, denial and the, just not considering it in that case? Um, the question is whether there's a difference between a denial and not considering it, and I believe that would be clear on the order. My recollection, I don't have the order in front of me. I seem to remember that too. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's it's pretty on the um, the order um, sample order forms that the administrative office of the courts has developed. Um, they make it pretty clear whether it's being denied because the person didn't meet the criteria, or whether it's they're just declining to issue it because it's not in their jurisdiction. Yes. So that means that if you do file in the case in the court in which you have in the county in which you live, that may not be the county in which your conviction is out, they can turn you down and force you to file in the county in which you Yes. So the question is if you um, file in the county you live but you don't have any convictions there, so let's say you live in King County, all of your convictions are in Yakima County, 
you, you apply for a crop in King, and yes, the court could decide, I am not going to issue a, a crop um, for you because none of the, the crimes were in the jurisdiction of King County, but they are required to dismiss without prejudice. And so the person can go and file in Yakima County. Yes. And two things about that, I, I'm not clear that, so if it's, in the scenario that you just proposed, is, um, is there, um, is, is the decision made simply based upon the written record of information provided by the applicant? And is there a process whereby the prosecutor or other entities in the, in the criminal justice system can oppose? So um, my understanding is that, um, okay, so the question is, will they only be making the decision based on the paperwork that is filed by the applicant or um, will other entities such as the prosecutor's office be able to oppose the um, application or provide other information? Is that right? Um, so my understanding is that um, the prosecutor's office will be able to provide additional information and they'll have notice of the application. Um, I guess if others did have notice of the application, they could also present information. Um, it's not really specific in the statute. Yeah, because, I mean, it talks about here that the prosecutor is providing the, the criminal, history. criminal history, but it doesn't, it wasn't clear if there is any additional. There's, there's nothing prohibiting it and there's nothing requiring it. And is in the statute, if, if the applicant meets the statutory requirements, is it, um, is, does, how much discretion does the judge have then? Can you meet the statutory requirements and the judge can still deny you as a matter of discretion? Like, is there a so, yeah. Thing? So the, the question is, um, if you meet all of the statutory requirements, may the judge still deny you? And, you know, again, as without having seen this in action, it's hard to know that. My answer now would be no, um, if the, especially if the, if the judge is looking at crimes that were within the jurisdiction or a limited, a court of limited jurisdiction within that county, mm -hmm. um, and you meet all of the requirements, I don't think that they are able to deny you. And if, if you're going to talk about this, stop me, and I don't need to be uh, uh, getting ahead of you. Um, is there an appeal process for denials? Is there an appeal process is the question. And I mean, it's, it's filed as a civil action. And so um, I think you could use the same um, methods of appeal that exist for any other type of civil action. Um, OK. So moving on. So now the person has their crop. The judge has granted it and signed off. And from here, the clerk gets, you know, the, the um, certificate will get filed um, by the clerk the same way as any other legal uh, proceeding is handled. But in this case, the clerk has, is required to send a copy of the crop to the Washington State Patrol. And then the Washington State Patrol will report the crop on the person's criminal history. So that means that any time a criminal history is requested, um, by an employer or a landlord or someone else who is doing a background check, um, the crop will appear along with the rest of the person's criminal history. Yes. Uh, have you guys talked to Washington State Patrol? How will it appear? You know, when you showed that example of a history, sometimes you know, is it going to be one general statement, or will it be in each case that applied to the crop? You know, how sometimes with gun restores you see in each case. Okay. So the question is, how will it? Have we talked to the Washington State Patrol about how it will appear, whether it will appear um, in relationship to each case or as one single event? And I don't know the answer to that, but we can find out. Um, and. You know, this, this question was asked earlier, but a crop does not apply to future criminal history. It only applies to anything that had happened um, before the crop was granted. And in some cases, it's limited to certain crimes. Okay, so next is talking about what a crop will do. Um, so a crop is intended to um, restore eligibility for occupational licenses for people who are able to obtain one of these certificates. Um, so if, if someone has a crop, um, they cannot be denied most occupational licenses solely based on their criminal history. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to this, which I'll go over in a moment, but um, that is the legal effect of a crop. 
employers and housing providers are not legally required to consider a crop, but they may use their discretion, they may consider it. And some of the feedback that we've heard from employers and landlords um, through this process is that they think that it will be a helpful piece of information to have um, when they're considering whether to rent or rent to or hire someone who has a criminal history. So a couple of exceptions to talk about. Um, there are some occupations and categories of occupations where, which are excluded from the effect of a crop. Um, one is law enforcement. If you want to apply to become a police officer and have a criminal history, a crop does not have any impact on how um, the law enforcement agency considers your application. Um, second is uh, licenses to practice law. Again, um, the Washington State Bar Association is exempted from having to consider um, a crop in a person's application. Um, there are also some occupations listed in the statute that relate to financial responsibility or fiduciary duty, um, which may still deny someone based solely on their criminal history. Um, some examples of this are accountants, real estate brokers, um, security guards, notaries, um, things like that. There are licenses involving work with vulnerable populations, which are also excluded. Um, these are listed in the law as well, but some examples are teacher, teachers, nursing home administrators, assisted living facility employees. Um, so some of those occupations where the person is going to have a lot of um, unsupervised contact with um, vulnerable populations. And finally, um, there are licenses related to healthcare, which are ex exempted as well. Um, so physicians and physician assistants and nursing are all excluded. Um, so that, again, means that if, if um, the person is seeking an, a license or cert certification in any of these areas, um, the agency may deny them based solely on their criminal record. Um, so another exception is, relates to um, certifications or licenses that fall under the purview of the Department of Social and Health Services or Department of Health. Um, so these agencies may still deny someone who has a crop based solely on a criminal record, but before they do so, they have to do an individualized inquiry. So they can't have a blanket, um, ex a blanket ban for someone who has a crop. They have to consider first um, the nature and seriousness of the crime or the criminal history, um, the time since the person was incarcerated, um, how much time has passed, any change, change circumstances, um, and the nature of the employment or license sought. And so, you know, they're really what it's trying to get at is whether there's any, um, you know, what, what the risk is and if there's any connection between um, the conviction and what the person is applying to do. Um, one thing that I just want to mention here is if you are working with someone who has a crop and is denied a license by um, an agency because of their criminal record, uh, we would encourage people to um, appeal those decisions to the Office of Administrative Hearings or other um, appellate body that considers um, agency decisions. Okay, and um, one other kind of disclaimer here is talking about what a crop does not do. Um, so a crop does not impact any findings that are included on the abuse and neglect registry. So this is a registry that is uh, maintained by Department of Social and Health Services. Um, it is not criminal history, um, and crop does not have any effect on that. Um, it does not restore firearms rights, and it doesn't remove any information from a criminal record. So many, most of you have likely heard of um, vacating or sealing um, convictions on a criminal record. CROP doesn't do that. Um, everything that is part of a criminal a person's criminal history will still show up on a background check um, within the bounds of what is um, can be reported, of course. Um, and CROP will be one of those things, um, but it won't remove anything. Okay, so we are ready to move on to examples. Do we have any questions before we do that? Yes, Annie. So, um, Melissa, if, if you um, would speak to the value of even, you know, let's say somebody, that crop has gone into effect now, and I have a, um, I have two misdemeanors that mm -hmm. are now seven years old. Um, I would be qualified potentially to get a, to get them vacated. Right. Um, 
but could you speak to why it would also be useful to get across? Okay. And maybe help people understand that, including me. Yeah, of course. Um, so there's a request for some more um, explanation about why it might be useful to have a crop um, uh, for someone who the example is if they have two misdemeanors, it's been seven years, maybe they don't qualify to have them vacated, why is a crop useful? No, let's say they do qualify to have them vacated, like why Why would we be telling people, to, like, just go get them vacated? But I, it yeah, seems I to me, question. Yeah. Th it seems to me that it's also useful for people to be getting a crop, and that's what I was wondering if you could Yeah, I mean, that is a good question, and um, I mean, and maybe maybe it would be helpful for the person to do both, but I think, um, you know, I mean, I think vacating is helpful because it removes something from the criminal record. We know that in the digital age, things that are vacated are not always removed from the criminal record, and sometimes they show up. Um, so it, it could be helpful to go and get a crop, um, you know, just as proof or, you know, evidence to a landlord or housing provider um, that, you know, the person is on the right track, they're stable, they're doing the right thing, they've met all of these requirements that show that they're um, kind of in compliance with the law. Um, and so it still might, it, it may provide some benefit to people. And if there are any, you know, and I'm not sure with the occupational licensing, if there are any ramifications that extend beyond that, um, it could help with the licensing as well. Yeah, and I was just wondering, like, in terms of folks educating defendants who, I mean, because I can see one of the barriers to vacating being they haven't paid off their elephant. Exactly. In your next slide, you give an example. So let's say that person that keeps paying, they're eventually, and to keep them educated to come back for that vacate when they're eligible because, right. you know, so they don't, I got the crop, I mean, you know, just so they take it yeah. the best thing for them. Absolutely. So another, um, the comment was that, um, you know, a crop can be sort of a step before someone is able to vacate. So um, one of the requirements to vacate a conviction from your criminal record is that um, you have to have paid off your LFOs before the waiting period begins. Um, and so many people are not able to pay off their LFOs for ever. for a long time, <laughs> if ever, um, after a criminal conviction. And so a crop is something that might um, you know, be a step along the way and provide people more access and reduce barriers for people with a criminal record before they're able or qualified to vacate. And the only other follow-up, you, you had touched upon this point about the, the criminal records, and even when uh, convictions may be removed from official databases, right, there are so many employers and <clears throat> landlords and other entities that rely on, right. you know, once you have a criminal record and it's out there in all of the databases that are private databases that are available on the internet, it's almost impossible to actually get it wiped out of those kinds of databases. Um, so I think that having, uh, it seems that it would be, um, you know, having a crop can only be helpful to have, you know, to be laying to rest. Absolutely. So um, that's a very good point. And the comment is that um, one thing that that we, many of us know, is that even if um, a person is able to um, vacate a conviction and technically have it removed from their criminal record, um, because there are many private companies and vendors that um, provide criminal background checks for um, employers and landlords, um, oftentimes, even if it's vacated from the official record, it doesn't actually disappear from the public domain. And so um, having a crop, crop might be sort of an insurance policy um, for people, even if they have been able to vacate, to show that um, they're doing the right thing. Yes. We have a question from the internet. Che Barrow writes, do you know how a crop will appear on a tenant screening report? The question is, do we know how a crop will appear on a tenant screening report? And I do not know. I mean, it is, it, you know, to the extent that the criminal history is background check is part of that report, the crop will be provided um, along with the rest of the criminal history. But in terms of exactly what it will look like, I don't know. Uh, I would also just think uh, on the crop versus vacate issue that Logistically, it's kind of a big deal. The crop could apply to theoretically your entire criminal history across the state. Good point. In one single court procedure rather than vacating individually. 
right? So um, Alex has another good point that, um, you know, in considering the difference between vacating a conviction versus getting a crop is that um, crop has the potential to apply to your entire criminal history where as um, to vacate a conviction, it's you have to go conviction by conviction and depending on the class of, of um, conviction that it is, you might be limited in how many times you can vacate. Did I get that right? Okay. All right. So let's talk about our example. Okay, so we are looking at um, a gentleman named Joe Smith. Um, he lives in Seattle with his spouse and their two children. Um, he's currently employed as a custodian making $30,000 a year. He was convicted of theft two, which is a class C felony in 2006 and served two years in the Department of Corrections. Prior to that, he was convicted of two misdemeanors in 1998, um, malicious mischief three and theft three. All of his convictions are from Yakima County. Um, he has no other criminal history, um, but he does owe $1,200 in outstanding LFOs, um, and he makes regular payments of $10 a month as required by his payment plan. He would like to apply for a crop. So using this example, let's walk through um, all of the eligibility criteria to see if Joe can um, get a crop. So the first step is to look at his conviction history. So we know Joe has one Class C felony as well as two misdemeanors. Um, does he qualify? And the answer is yes. So Joe doesn't have any Class A felonies. He doesn't have any sex offenses or offenses that have a sexual motivation enhancement. Um, he doesn't have to register as a sex offender. Um, so Joe qualifies according to his criminal history. The next thing that we have to look at is the waiting period. So um, because he has a Class C felony, we, the longest waiting period that would apply to Joe would be two years from the date he was released from um, prison. So we know that he was convicted in 2006 and he served two years. So 2008 would be the earliest that he would have been eligible. Um, we're in 2016, so Joe has long since uh, passed the waiting period for a crop. Um, compliance with sentencing. So here we would have to look at his judgment and sentence to see what the conditions of his sentence were to know whether he is in compliance. Um, because it's been so long, let's assume that he is. Um, and the important thing that to talk about from the fact pattern here are the LFOs. So we know that Joe still has outstanding LFOs, but he is making payments in compliance with his payment plan. He's current with his payment plan. Um, so he would meet that criteria. But again, it's important to look at the judgment sentence to make sure there's nothing else that, um, that would apply. Um, and finally, we know that Joe doesn't have any new criminal justice involvement. He doesn't have any new arrests. He doesn't have any um, new convictions or pending charges. So Joe meets all of the eligibility criteria. He can apply for a crop. So now I'm going to show you. Um, I have a quick question on that, though. Yeah. Is that this is where in uh, Yakima County he's living in, King now. So does he now have to report to both courts? So let's, yeah, so we'll walk through it as we go through um, the forms and talk about that. That's a good question. So the question was um, since he lives in King County now, but his convictions were Yakima County, how does that affect him in his application? So um, this is the petition for um, Certificate of Restoration of Opportunity is a few pages long. This is the first page. Um, and as you can see, it's um, drafted in a way that allows someone to just sort of fill it out like a form. Um, so the first part is um, asks whether, you know, there's the, the information at the top. You have to designate which county um, you're applying in. and so. Um, that has to be filled in along with the name. The case number will be provided when um, it's filed with the court. The court will provide the case number. Um, and so right under, right above this box here, um, the petitioner has to, to state whether they're applying for a crop that will apply to their entire criminal history or whether they only want it to apply to certain um, convictions in their criminal history. And if they only wanted to apply to certain convictions, they would list those um, in this table here. Um, and again, that, that might be the case if someone has, has to go to multiple counties to get crops that apply to their convictions from the various um, jurisdictions where they've um, had involvement. 
So here is the declaration that is um, part of the um, part of the petition. And so the applicant has to declare under penalty of perjury that all of these these things are true and fill out the form. So first is the qualified court. So this gets to the question that you asked. So you see there's, um, they can either check that they're applying where they reside or um, where they have criminal history. And so Joe, he doesn't have any criminal history in King County, but that's where he's um, filing his, his petition for a crop. So that's the box that he checked. If he was filing in Yakima County, he would check the other one. The second thing is the notice to the prosecuting attorney. So again, the person is swearing that they have provided notice to the prosecuting attorney in that Joe is swearing that he has provided notice to the prosecuting attorney in King County. Because all of his convictions are more than five years old, he is not required to provide notice to the prosecuting attorney in Yakima County. Um, and you'll see here at the very bottom of the section on um, number two is that he has to attach copies of the notice notices that he has provided to the King County prosecuting attorney. Um, section three is where Joe has to state what his criminal history is. There are two boxes. One is on this page, one is on the next page. The first box um, is for any convictions in the county where Joe is applying. Since Joe doesn't have any convictions from King County, he would leave this box blank. Um, and then you'll see at the top of this page that um, there's another table to list any criminal history from outside of the county of application. So since all of Joe's criminal history is from Yakima, he lists all of his convictions in this box. And you can see he's got his, the three convictions that are listed in the fact pattern are included here. Um, and then fourth, he has to, um, swear to that he meets all of the criteria that we went over earlier. So um, first is the waiting period. So Joe has um, two misdemeanors or gross misdemeanors. And so he checks the box that one, and he didn't, we know that he didn't serve any jail time on those. So he checks the box that one year has passed since the date of his sentencing. The next section is on class B or C felony. So we know Joe has a class C felony. Um, and that two years have passed since he was released from total confinement. So that's the box he checks. Um, if he did, hadn't served any time, he would check the box about sent, the um, time that has passed since sentencing. But we know that he's, he served some time in DOC. So um, two years have passed since he was released. The next um, section is about any violent offenses. Joe doesn't have any violent offenses, so he's going to check that it doesn't apply. And that's at the very bottom. It might be hard for some of you to see. All right, number five is that he's in compliance with his sentencing requirements. Um, he checks the box that he is in compliance, including his legal financial obligations. And this requires that Joe um, attach copies of the judgment and sentence or adjudication orders for each conviction um, to prove that he's in compliance. Yes. <clears throat> so, Melissa, and, and just for your listeners, this is Annie Gunston with the Washington Defender Association, and I wanted to put out the I did to folks in the room and on the line, you know, one, if the LFO issue is a hurdle, mm -hmm. right, like let's say Joe wasn't in compliance, right? Like let's say he had $5,000 of outstanding LFOs mm -hmm. that he hadn't been paying, and that would be cause for actually circling back to Joe's public defender and asking the public defender to get a hearing about those, uh, a hearing with the criminal court judge to actually get that kind of a payment plan set up, mm -hmm. or to possibly reduce the payment plan, or to okay. you know to modify the to modify the LFO um, condition of sentence that would make it possible to actually file the crop. Good, good comment, Annie. So um, Annie, who is, Annie Benson, who is with the Washington Defender Association, um, has commented that if the person does have issues qualifying for a crop because they're not in compliance with their LFO payment plan, that um, they may uh, want to reach out to the public defense agency that um, represented them to request um, help with getting a hearing in front of the criminal court to modify their payment plan or, um, you know, get relief from the LFOs in some way so that they would, could come and to also, if, I, if I could follow up on yes. that comment, there's also, for people who are uh, working as service providers, if they aren't in compliance with their LFO payment plan, that's also going to be a condition 
uh, likely violating their probation, and there still are some counties that that is a risk of them being brought back in front of the court and possibly even yes. end up in jail. So um, for people who aren't in compliance and service providers should be screening out people to be, sh they shouldn't be filing for that without meeting with a public defender if they're not in compliance. Right, and so following up on that is that, um, especially for service providers out there, um, for people who are not in compliance with their LFOs, oftentimes that means that they are violating um, the terms of their conditions, and in some counties that puts them at risk of um, uh, a warrant issuing and, and being picked up and incarcerated. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're talking to clients who have LFOs that they're not in compliance with, um, they should be referred to their public defenders that if that's the case, um, because uh, we don't want to see people filing crops and then getting picked up and incarcerated because they're not. They're and also, their public defenders can be helping them. I mean, they exactly. can, can serve even if you can't, even if you can't help them file the crop, you can be the link that connects them back with their public defender. Who it, there's so much renewed engagement mm -hmm. around LFOs. You know, for someone like Joe. Um, you know, there. You know, back in you know 2006. I mean, the the landscape is really shifting, and so yeah. you may be the link to get them connected with their public defender to actually go back and do that, even if they can't file the problem. Okay, so the service providers can really serve as a link back to the public defenders um, to so that they can get the help they need to file a crop, even if the service provider isn't able to do that. And I'm adding to that, of course, this is more King County, where a lot of these cases. The more recent cases, you're not going to see LFOs other than restitution or the mandatory stuff. But the clerk's office can also be a resource. I don't know that you always need to go through. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't if you have some special request. But the clerk's office, a lot of times, in King County, you give the financial declaration to them. They'll set a payment plan. Mm -hmm. and, and so a lot of times, because a lot of times if they come in and say, I'm going to apply it, we're going to go first to check with the clerk. So mm -hmm. a lot of people, I think, overlook the clerk's office. But mm -hmm. that's a pretty simple Right. Correct. So Laura from the uh, King County Prosecutor's Office <clears throat> commented that um, in some counties, the clerk's office can also be a resource, um, in King County in particular, and um, that, but it's not true in every county, and so you want to be a little bit careful about that. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, sometimes the clerk's office is willing to work with people to set up a payment plan if the person comes on LFOs, if the person comes in with um, evidence and information about their what they are actually able to contribute toward their LFOs. So, yes. Can you, Power, at some point, talk a little bit about showing good cause for non -compliance? Yes, yes, I can. Um, so, talk, you know, showing good cause for non-compliance with LFOs. Um, so you'll see on the form in Section 5 that, you know, there are three options to check about your LFOs. You can either say you've paid them, you're in compliance with your payment plan, or you have good cause. Um, so the crop law is vague about what constitutes good cause, which we hope will be liberally interpreted. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think some of the things that, um, people would want to think about in um, trying to show good cause for not um, complying with their payment plan is, you know, any of the circumstances that um, that make it make it so that they really aren't able to pay on their LFOs or aren't able to pay the amount that has been set. Oftentimes, um, you know, uh, the court, the court or the clerk or the DOC will set sort of a minimum plan, sometimes without really looking at the person's financial um, resources or their like current financial situation, um, but just have sort of a stock minimum payment of fifty dollars a month or something. Um, and so, you know, providing there are resources out there for financial declarations, providing some information to the court about what the what income the the applicant has, what expenses they're required to pay, and really showing what's left over at the end of the day, um, so, so that the court can see that. They're not just deciding they don't want to pay their LFOs, but they're really not able to. Um, that's the sort of thing that I hope the courts will consider good cause for not paying. A couple of things to add to that. If, again, if you're able to get in touch with your public defender, mm -hmm. conviction is a goal. The, the public defender should have had, um, uh, in order, to, there should be in the public defender's file an assessment of this information. Right. You know, it may just be a couple of years old. Um, but two additional. Um, 
possible resources to think about or arguments to make. If the person is qualifying for a fee waiver right. for this application, right, that information will support this. And the other thing is there is this great thing uh, that, that, that MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, put out. It's called the Living Wage Calculator. Uh -huh. And if you do MIT and Living Wage Calculator, it's this fabulous resource. They have every county in the country. And so you can go there and put Washington State, uh -huh. and you can put the county that you're in, and it will provide the court and the clerk and the judge, hey, here's what the living wage is for the person in my circumstances, somebody who's supporting a spouse and two kids, like uh -huh. Joe, right? Here's what a living wage would be in Whatcom County, and here's what Joe's making. Right. So it's this great, it's a, it's a really fabulous reason. Defenders are starting to use it more and more in the criminal cases. Oh, interesting. And it's really readily accessible. Okay, so a couple of comments and suggestions from um, Annie Benson. One is that, especially in newer cases, the public defender may have um, already gathered information about the person's um, financial situation that they could use to support a good cause argument um, for a crop. So that would be a good place to start um, to see if the public defender has had that information in the file. Second is, um, Annie pointed out, that if the person has already qualified for the civil fee, uh, filing fee waiver under GR 34, um, that that should support the argument that they have good cause for not paying their LFOs. And finally, she suggested a resource um, that has been put out by MIT, which is a living wage calculator, uh, which looks at what a living wage would be by each county across the country, um, and commented that a lot of public defenders have started using this tool, and it's a really great resource um, for uh, showing what people's financial um, capabilities are. That's great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so, Finally, um, as part of the declaration, uh, Joe also has to swear that he does, hasn't been convicted of any of the crimes that would disqualify him from receiving a crop, that he doesn't have to register as a sex offender, and that he doesn't have any new crimes um, since the last conviction. And then Joe signs his declaration and petition under penalty of perjury, and he's ready to file. Um, you know, this is the example of the notice that needs to be provided to the prosecuting attorney's office in the um, county where Joe is is um, applying. So Joe would fill this out, provide it to the King County prosecuting attorney's office, and as was suggested earlier, we would recommend that people attach a copy of their petition, even though this form doesn't indicate that. It is good practice and will help things move along. Um, and then the third form that I mentioned earlier is the proof of service. So Joe must file this um, with the court and attach both and attach the notices to each of the prosecuting attorneys. So in this case, Joe only had to notify the King County prosecutor, so he would want to attach a copy of the notice he gave to the King County prosecuting attorney's office. He has to say when he served them and whether it was done by mail or personal delivery. And again, he signs under penalty of perjury that this is something that he has already done. Okay, and um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to turn it over to Alex for information about additional resources. Any other questions before I do that? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm really just going to talk about one resource. It's the one that we offer here at Columbia Legal Services. Uh, it's called the Reentry Legal Clinic. It's a free monthly, bi-monthly clinic um, for low-income people who are facing barriers to reentry. Um, our current caseload is uh, largely um, focused on LFO issues, but we do already offer help for people who are being denied housing or employment because of a criminal history, um, and a crop certain, will certainly be part of that service going forward. Um, so we welcome referrals. Uh, people can call for information or an appointment. And the number on the slide, 206-287-8625. Um, there are two times and locations each month, one at the King County Courthouse and one at Fair Start, which is kind of in the South Lake Union, North Downtown area. Um, here in Seattle. Um, those are the only in-person clinics. We, we do offer our service to everyone across the state. 
uh, if people are not in the area or can't access our clinic for other reasons, we can accommodate phone appointments. Or if it's just a time conflict, I can always set up appointments individually for people in our office. So um, please feel free to recommend people to us. I don't know yet if any of the other clinics in the area or across the state are going to be helping people with um, this particular matter, but uh, the forms really um, put up by the administrative office of the courts are pretty good and straightforward, I think, and so I don't think that it would be difficult for a lot of the clinics to provide that service for people, um, or at least give them some direction, show them where the forms are, and, and uh, give them what information they need. But we do offer that, so uh, please feel free to contact us or have clients or other referrals contact us. Yeah, they yes, that clinic at Fair Start is open to the public. It often fills up quickly with Fair Start students, um, but theoretically, it's open to anyone. Okay, well, that's it for our presentation today. Thank you very much for um, joining us. And as I stated earlier, we will post a copy of. Um, the PowerPoint as well as links to all of the resources and forms um, that we've talked about today so that um, there's a centralized location to access these. So thank you very much.